This video is sponsored by 1Password. This is the Google Pixel 6 Pro. This is the iPhone 13 Pro. And this, this is just some of my lifelong obsession with Apple products. But of all the Android phones that I've tried switching to, the Pixel 6 has been the one that I've been waiting for. It runs Android 12, which is made by Google. The phone itself is made by Google. And this is their first flagship phone in quite a few years. So the Pixel 6 and Pixel 6 Pro has everything it needs on their side to make a killer phone to rival the likes of the iPhone. But does it? Today, I'm gonna run you through everything from the good stuff, the bad stuff, and also just the things that are not good or bad, just different when coming from an iPhone. A huge thank you to 1Password for sponsoring this video. More about them later on, including a nice discount for anyone watching. But for now, let's get started with everything that I love about this phone. Now, firstly, and I think one of the most impressive things about this phone is the new voice typing. It is insanely accurate, and I love how it remembers any corrections or misspellings on the fly. In basically just any app, you can either tap a button or just say, hey Google, type. And it will turn on voice typing and then let you just tell it what to write. It adds all of the natural punctuation, full stops, even exclamation points. You can get it to add in emojis too, and then finish the message off by just saying, send. It works so well. My only bugbear here is that some apps haven't been updated to use the send command, like Beeper, which is the app that I use to send iMessages, but that is a minor issue. Overall, the voice to text feature works incredibly well, and it's actually one of the highlight features for me over using an iPhone. It is actually something I'd like to use more often, but in all honesty, there are still plenty of circumstances where you just won't be comfortable saying what needs to be said out loud. Some things, some things are best unspoken. Other features like the existing Google Lens where you can literally hold the camera up to live translate what your camera is pointing at can be great for looking at a menu and the live translate feature that gives you captions to anything, even passing conversation, is gonna be incredible when I hopefully get to travel some more next year. Google Assistant, also incredibly cool, but not quite there yet for some of us. It is incredibly cool. I only managed to screen record the very end of this call where I used the screen call feature and it was really cool, but the caller thought it was an answering machine, and as soon as they left their message, they then hung up. And then the call disappeared from my screen, and the only reason I actually know what they actually said is because I screen recorded the conversation. So they could do with some form of call history where this information could just sit, even just temporarily. It obviously isn't 100% accurate since that's not even a real phone number, but I can tell from the general gist of this call that it was a spam call. This whole Google Assistant thing wasn't marketed that well. The marketing around the feature itself 100% absolutely it was. But only today, the day I'm shooting this video, two weeks after I purchased this, did this feature start working for me here in the UK. And it seems that Google Assistant hasn't fully made its way to all countries yet. So if you're buying one of these for the voice features, then my advice would be just to double check first. Let's talk about that screen now. Firstly, the always on display is, well, always a pleasure to see. To be able to just glance down at your phone and see the date, the time, and recent notifications, so you know if you need to pick up your phone before you, will pick up your phone. I also love that it includes a marker for where you should put your finger to unlock the phone. This is a frustration that I've had on other Android phones where you just have to kind of guess where that sensor is. 120 hertz also works great, though more on that in a moment. And another thing that I really like that's actually quite subtle that's probably not worth mentioning, but the animations when you press the power button are really cool to see the screen fade kind of in and out from the side. It's nice to think a Google developer somewhere just had that thought of making something down to that level of detail. I mean, yes, you could just have the screen come on and go off like every other phone, but why not have it like this instead? Oh, and also in this probably is a bit random that no one else cares about, but the minimum brightness on this phone is dimmer than the iPhone 13, which actually is really good if you're using your phone in a dark room, you know, flicking through social media, or even watching the latest Squid Game on Netflix. It also goes bright, much brighter than the iPhone 13, which is good for those sunny days. And one really, really neat function of this screen, and Android in general, is that you can actually multitask. It is so refreshing to be able to do this on a phone. I know it might seem silly on a small screen, but in some specific use cases, it can be really great. You can watch a video whilst browsing the web or maybe message a friend or copy a password from your password manager over to another application or web page. How you use this will be different from person to person, but as an iPhone user, it was definitely useful to me. Now, notifications also fall under the great section because notifications are really, really great in the Pixel and in Android in general. But as someone who has used an iPhone for the last like, 
14 years. I have had 14 years to tweak my notifications, customize them to my exact needs and wants. So it is no surprise that when I moved from iPhone over to Android, that I was kind of overwhelmed with the amount of notifications. Now, the one thing that Android does have going for it, one thing, one of many things, is that you can really dig into the detail on notifications. You can tell it which type of notifications within individual applications that you want to receive. You can set custom ringtones or alert tones for specific notifications and even specific contacts. It is such a powerful thing in Android and one that over time you will customize and tailor to your exact needs. So that when something does pop up on screen or does make a noise, you'll know exactly who it is. Now let's talk battery because battery is something I've seen lots of conflicting information around online and in other reviewers who jumped the gun a little and actually any online reviews where you've seen people compare phones purely on battery life basis most of them are actually wrong because when you hear that Google Pixel learns your behavior and adapts the battery accordingly well they're not wrong in the first week I was getting close to empty by the end of most days mainly of course due to being new to me and using a lot more than I normally would but also because the battery life just sucked. But fast forward and we're now on week two and I'm easily getting a full day of battery life out of this phone. And in the evenings, I'm not even getting into that low battery warning mode that I was hitting previously, both on this Pixel 6 and on the older iPhone 11 Pro Max. Now, if I was to compare the Pixel 6 Pro with my iPhone 13 Pro, I would say they're both kind of on par when it comes to battery life. Overall, the battery life in this Pixel 6 Pro is solid. It's not life-changingly amazing, but it is plenty to get you through most days. Also a small but powerful feature if you have someone that's as forgetful as my wife who forgets to charge our phone all the time. Reverse wireless charging can be really good in a pinch. You can literally charge someone else's phone wirelessly with yours. Oh, and even the iPhone or the Apple AirPods, though I guess that's kind of sacrilege, charging an Apple product on the back of a Google product, but it does work really nicely. The quick erase feature, which lets you automatically, yes, automatically erase objects and people from not only pictures taken on the Pixel, but also any photos, even those taken on an iPhone, and it works really well. It's not really any different than using Photoshop and the tools that that gives you, but it is very quick and very convenient to be able to just do this on a mobile phone, and it, it does give you some really great results. Let's touch on Wi-Fi and phone signal briefly. I had no issues with mobile phone reception, and I actually picked up 5G fairly often. And the reason this is mentioned in the good things part of the video is that the Wi-Fi was noticeably better and more reliable than on my iPhone. When parking up outside my house, for example, it would connect much quicker to my home Wi-Fi. Whereas my iPhone, it kind of gets confused if you open an app mid connecting to Wi-Fi. It just doesn't know whether to use Wi-Fi or data. So it just doesn't do anything. And then we get to price. The price of this Pixel 6 Pro was £849 or $899. It's the Stormy Black model in 128 gig, and it is a good price considering it is a flagship model. Compare that to Apple, and it's $100 more for their 13 Pro model. And I'd say that's a really good price, and it's nice to actually see competitors come out with cheaper flagship models instead of Apple's constant price increases year on year. Not even is it a more affordable price, but in the UK, Google are giving away a pair of Bose 700 headphones to everyone who ordered at launch. Those alone cost almost half the price of the phone. Before we talk about the negatives, let's talk differences. These are things pretty much on par with Apple, but they're just different. And for me, the cameras and video in the Pixel are really, really great. Pictures themselves are clear. They have great detail in low light and in badly lit areas. It can be an absolute beast. It is also nice to have that extra four times telephoto for when you do actually want to zoom in or kind of use it as a macro camera. But there is a strange issue that I've seen when taking photos and videos where the quality on screen looks really noisy and pixelated, but the actual photo or video that it actually takes looks fine. I guess like after Google Google's AI thing has done its job to clean the image up. It's not something I've experienced on any other phone before and on the face of it you'll be thinking that the photos and videos are going to be really bad in those situations but more often than not they do turn out pretty well. One notable thing that I'd like to mention is the stabilization on the Pixel particularly with that 48 megapixel telephoto at f3.5 aperture. It is good. You can notably see this when using the phone when it feels like it takes a kind of a split second for the image on the screen to catch up with your hand movement. All in all, it does provide some really, really good footage overall. Now the front facing camera is also pretty good. It's color accurate, has great image quality, and the audio whilst it won't be as good as this professional audio, well, it's not bad. I couldn't honestly call it yet on whether the Pixel 6 is better than an iPhone for photos and videos, but if you'd like to see that, then a subscribe to the channel would be incredible. 
as right after this video, I'm spending a day shooting with my iPhone, this Pixel 6 and an S21 Ultra. So do stick around for that if you'd like to see it. Now let's talk Tensor now, because one thing proudly talked about by Google is the new Tensor chip inside this phone. It's the chip that makes it possible to do the clever image and video processing, and even the live transcription features all on board. There is zero need for this phone to be connected to the internet for it to do what it does. That feature alone is incredible. But what I will say in terms of the overall performance of this phone is that it's good. It's not light years ahead of anything. The apps launch and load up around about the same that they do on the iPhone 13 with that latest chip. Now let's talk Google Pay, which works well in terms of the technology, but I find the interface slow compared to Apple Pay. With Apple, you can just swipe fluidly through all of your cards, wait for Face ID, and then you're good to go. With Android 12 and the Pixel 6, you basically have a default card set then when you go to pay, you just make sure your phone is unlocked, which means just keeping your finger on that slightly unreliable fingerprint reader, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then it's basically it. But if you want to change the card you're using, then you have to go to tap a button, then scroll through them slower than you can on an iPhone. And I also find that it sometimes gets stuck on cards and needs multiple swipes to actually get it to move on, which when you're in a queue and trying to hurry, can be a little frustrating. When it comes to the screen, it is great, it's bright, and the 120 hertz thing is on par with Apple's ProMotion. I do prefer the curved edges, personally though, I find it more comfortable to hold both with or without a case on. And I didn't personally experience any issues typing like I have on the other Android phones where my palm would like catch the side of the keyboard. There is no pre-installed screen protector like you get on some other Android phones, though I'm one of those people who trust the strength of the glass and never actually use a screen protector on more any of my phones. And the size itself is also fairly usable. If you're coming from one of the larger iPhones, then this will pretty much be identical experience where you need to shift your grip to reach certain things or use the one-handed feature. If you are coming from an iPhone Pro or smaller, then this will feel noticeably bigger due to that extra height, but it is still definitely a comfortable hold. I'm waiting to test out a new case on this, the later case from Lou from Unbox Therapy. But in the meantime, I have been enjoying the Spigen liquid air case as it adds that extra protection, but without adding a lot of extra bulk to the phone. The Pixel 6s also include dust and water resistance at IP68, but it is the same story as Apple where they just won't cover any water damage under warranty. Now I can understand why this is the case because you could drown your phone in an ocean at much deeper depths and then claim it failed the IP68 rating, but I just wish there was a better way for them to detect water ingress and be able to cover phones under warranty that have been used within like the IP68 ratings. USB-C charging is also incredibly useful and now there's one less USB cable I need to carry around with me, I just wish Apple would catch up and change their lightning connector over like they have on their latest iPads. Now, one difference that I do like from a design perspective is the way they've positioned their cameras because with them being in a straight line like this, well, you can put your phone down on a table and use it without it rocking back and forth. Simple things. Over to the negatives and unfortunately, there are quite a few, which won't necessarily ruin the overall experience of having a Pixel, but from my perspective of a solid iPhone user, these are things you should be aware of. Firstly, unlocking the phone. The fingerprint reader is pretty crap, in all honesty. I have tested other Android phones and none of them have been as bad as the optical sensor on this Pixel 6. It is very bright and also very slow, but being bright, it also means if you're in a dark room and want to unlock your phone, then it's going to shine, well, a very bright light. Not the best thing if you don't want to wake up the other half whilst in bed or in a cinema. And you can't just lightly touch it either, like on the S21, which has an ultrasonic sensor. And I find that half of the time, the phone just doesn't unlock because I'm either not pressing hard enough or in the right place, even though I've added my fingerprints multiple times and enabled the enhanced touch sensitivity. Now, currently there is no way to fix this. It's pretty much a hardware decision made by Google and your own experiences may vary. So it just fully depends on how good and I guess how clear your fingerprint is and how well the phone and that bright light can see it when you push down on the sensor. There is also no face unlock, so you can't even switch to that. And coming from an iPhone, which has a pretty rock solid face ID system where you just glance at your phone. It just kind of feels like a step backwards. Now the most common fix to this I tend to be told is those who say to use the feature that leaves your phone unlocked when you're connected to a known Wi-Fi network or a Bluetooth device. That is fine, but most of you must not have kids because kids like to play with things. Next up, let us talk please about the biggest and most frustrating thing that I've come across so far with my Pixel 6 experience, and that is bugs. Now this is reflective of Android 12 overall rather than specifically the Pixel, so do take these next few comments with a bit of a pinch of salt whilst knowing that Android 12 is still new, and by the time you get yours, these issues may not actually be an issue anymore. I have had a small amount of bugs 
with this phone that I otherwise wouldn't expect from a flagship phone where both the operating system, Android 12, and the phone itself are made by the same company. Typing doesn't work in one app that I use, it just gets all jumbled and confused. Twitter is a bit jerky when scrolling, though you can fix that by forcing the screen to 120 hertz in developer settings, though that does then impact battery life. I had a bug when trying to pay off my credit card where it would just hang and I tried multiple times with no luck, picked up my iPhone and it went through first time. And YouTube Studio. Now I know this won't affect most Pixel 6 owners, but YouTube Studio is the most frustratingly buggy thing that I've ever come across on this phone. And it's made worse because it's an app made by Google, running on Google OS, running on Google hardware. I've seen multiple people complain and report it to Google who don't really seem interested in fixing it. They just say delete and reinstall and wipe the phone and then just say that they haven't heard of the issue before. When literally every single person I know with a YouTube channel and a Pixel have tweeted to ask them to fix it. Kind of annoying. It led me to actually post a poll on social media to see what I should expect when it comes to bugs on Android. And the poll kind of got derailed by a lot of the whole kind of iPhone versus Android crowds. But overall, the sentiment is that Android 12 is still very new. It's not quite finished. And we should be expecting some updates in the coming weeks and months to fix these issues. Now, in comparison to the iPhone, I've not seen anything like this level of bugs before unless I was running their pre-release like beta versions of the software before they actually get released to the public. Yes, there might be the odd app crash where it just crashes the home screen, but you just relaunch and it's fine. But with Android, I'm finding bugs which are repeatable and that there are no workarounds for as of yet. Moving on from bugs and crashes, one really minor annoyance is something I used on iPhone a fair bit, which was holding down the space bar to get like this mouse cursor up. With this, you can move around text just like when using a mouse on iPhone. It feels really fluid, natural, and is exactly like using a mouse. Whereas on the Pixel 6, at least the default keyboard just doesn't work the same. You can hold spacebar down, but you can only really scroll forwards and backwards. You can't really go up and down and certainly not as mouse-like as on an iPhone. It's not something that I've gotten used to where I can reliably and easily like navigate around text. Though with that said, if you are using the Google Voice text to type feature, then you may never actually really need to use this. Next is something that Apple have recently introduced in their iCloud kind of Apple ecosystem thing, which is the ability to mask your email address when signing up for various services and sending emails. And thank you to 1Password, this is now possible outside of the Apple ecosystem with the partnership with Fastmail, where you can generate unique email addresses when signing up for individual services. And if you get spammed on that email address, then well, chances are you'll know which service it came from. And now you can easily just ditch that account without having to repeatedly unsubscribe or set up all sorts of complicated email rules and delete those spammy kind of emails. And again, a huge thank you to 1Password for sponsoring this video. It makes these types of honest reviews possible because I actually bought this phone myself. And so I'm not under any form of embargo or NDA or worried that I'm gonna upset like the Google gods by saying the wrong thing. There is a link down below for up to 50% off a 1Password family subscription. So if you are currently just using the built-in Google Password Manager, then definitely go check that out. Overall, the Google Pixel 6 has been kind of everything that I'd hope to see in an Android device, but with a few caveats. The question for you is, of course, are those caveats a reason for you not to buy a Pixel and go with something else? For a direct camera comparison between the iPhone 13 Pro, the S21 and the Pixel 6 Pro, then click here. To see why you shouldn't be using the built-in Chrome Password Manager, then click here. My name is Pete Matheson. Thank you for watching, and I'll see your smiling faces in the next video. Thank you.